morning and thank you for joining us for the first session of oh, sorry of using the ACM criteria as a treatment matching tool for adolescents. I'm Liz Philman with the Virginia Tech Richmond Center, and we are delighted to be providing the virtual conference management and technical support for this training. Thanks again for joining us today. And now I would like to introduce Nina Marino, Director of the Office of Child and Family Services at the Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services to offer a welcome. Hello, my name is Nina Marino and I'm the Director of the Office of Child and Family Services at the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services. Welcome to this training series on adolescent substance use screening, assessment and treatment. I wanted to take a brief moment to thank Mia McCoy from our office, who will be your host and contact from DBHDS regarding any training logistics and who also put together this training series with Dr. Fishman. Virginia Tech for their support logistically to make this event happen in a virtual environment. And of course, Dr. Fishman for bringing his expertise to Virginia. The Office of Child and Family Services has been fortunate to be able to allocate $5.3 million in new one-time funding through 2025 for adolescent and young adult substance use treatment and recovery services. And this training series is funded through these efforts as part of our larger workforce development initiative to expand training efforts across the state in the field of adolescent substance use. Our office like you has been disheartened and concerned with the recent data coming from the Surgeon General, as well as the American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the National Children's Hospital Association on what is being called a national emergency on children's mental health due to the pandemic, social and racial unrest, and other factors prevalent before COVID. And as we know, there's a high correlation between mental health challenges such as depression and anxiety and substance use, especially with our younger population. Data from the Virginia Department of Health Youth Risk Survey in 2019 found that 16% of high school students um, responded that they'd had their first drink before age 13, a quarter report currently drinking alcohol, and 17% currently use marijuana. And that same survey indicated that 10% of respondents who were in middle school use prescription pain medication without a doctor's prescription. Statewide, our pediatric health care providers who are part of our Virginia Mental Health Access Program rep reported seeing an increase in first-time substance use, depression and anxiety symptoms following the onset of COVID. And national data from Mental Health America support findings in the state of Virginia regarding uh, the pandemic and seeing increases in um, suicide risk and other behavioral issues in young adults and adolescents. And these findings are supported by our local community service boards, noting increases in substance use among especially the transition age population. It's noted that roughly 45% of pediatricians routinely screen adolescents for substance use, and 90% of adults diagnosed with a substance use disorder started using substances before age 18, with about half of them reporting their first use at age 15. So we know this is an especially vulnerable time and an important time for us to think about our interventions and early identification. And the continued impacts of the pandemic are being felt by all of us every day and our young people are no different. We know there are very big risk factors for youth who might be struggling with mental health or substance use or physical or emotional safety. And so we hope that by providing more training along with other initiatives that we can begin to address some of these needs along with the incredible work that each of you does every day to serve the youth in our state. So the goals of our office are to do a few things. We want to expand the existing model of care for substance use exposed or dependent youth up to age 21, increase screening and assessment for substance exposure use and disorders, enhance a collaborative care model between private providers, primary care practices, and CSBs specializing in adolescent and young adult mental health and substance use services implement sustainable evidence-based treatment models for substance exposed independent youth and improve health and social emotional functioning through recovery oriented programming. Some of the other projects in our office I wanna just briefly mention are a statewide needs assessment on our current adolescent treatment services available, what those gaps are, policy recommendations that we need to think about, workforce development needs, as well as national best practice models. And we're working on funding for young adult peer specialists, corresponding training for them, 
and expanding evidence-based treatment practices such as the adolescent community reinforcement approach. As well, we just received a five-year grant from SAMHSA to implement ESPER, which is screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment in our pediatric practices in a couple parts of the state. Yeah. We're really excited about all these initiatives we have going on, and we hope these will have uh, a positive impact on our young people in Virginia. We also know at present there's limited training geared towards mental health providers who overwhelmingly make up the children's services network here in Virginia. And with the current challenges in our workforce, there's an increasing need to focus on integrated care into existing settings such as primary care practices and within traditional mental health services, as referrals to specialty providers are very challenging and will continue to be so for the foreseeable future. Therefore, our goals with this four part training series is to provide you with basic practical tools to expand integrated care for youth in mental health or primary care settings with the additional resources needed for an understanding of the American Society of Addiction Medicine or ASAM levels of care for adolescents in particular, along with brief intervention strategies, family engagement strategies and uh, referrals if necessary. So now I'd like to introduce your trainer over the next four series. We thank you for choosing to spend this time with us over the next 90 minutes today, and we hope that you'll find this training practical and useful in your clinical settings. So Dr. Mark Fishman is an addiction psychiatrist and leads the Maryland Treatment Center, Mount Manor, which is a regional behavioral health care provider. They offer programs for residential and outpatient substance use disorder and co-occurring treatment for youth and adults. He's a member of the psychiatry faculty at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. His academic and research work has focused on addiction, pharmacotherapy, models of care for youth, particularly with opioid use disorder and treatment placement. Dr. Fishman served as the co-editor for the most recent editions of the ASAM cr criteria for treatment of substance related disorders. He served as past president of the DC Maryland Society of Addiction Medicine and is a current member of its board. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Fishman. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, thanks for that great introduction and uh, kindly uh, introducing me. It's great to be with you here today. And uh, I'm gonna share my screen, but as you heard, uh, I'm a shrink. I hope you won't hold that against me, uh, but I do direct clinical care of uh, both adolescents, young adults, and also adults across the lifespan uh, with addiction and co-occurring disorders. I also do research, uh, particularly uh, on opioid use disorder and particularly in young people and do program management. So I've had the privilege over the years of having these different perspectives, and I hope I can help bring some of that together uh, today uh, as we share this training. So let me just get this up. So we'll be talking today um, and for the next uh, four installations in this series on the topic of approaches to substance use disorders in youth. Uh, with a focus on ESPERT, as we heard, uh, screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment, and use of the ASAM criteria as a lens into assessment, uh, severity gradations, treatment matching and placement, and uh, along the way cover uh, some other topics, uh, kind of a whirlwind tour or overview, if you will, of some of the key issues and approaches to youth treatment today. We'll start with the intro as we're doing now, uh, focus on two big topics. One is developmental vulnerability. What is it about young people that make them vulnerable and have the considerable risk that they do? And then talk about models of what is a substance use disorder, what drives it, and how young people might be driven in their progression from early experimentation in the vulnerability that we'll talk about to progression to continued use, escalating use, loss of control and substance use disorder. In future uh, episodes, we'll, we'll talk about particular substances, we'll get into the uh, some of the details of treatment and talk in particular about treatment matching, specialty treatment and referral. So as we begin, just a couple of points. Dr. Fishman. Yes. I don't I don't mean to interrupt you, but your screen is not in presenter mode and we can see all of your notes. It is not in presenter mode. 
All right, then I will switch to, not that it's bad that you see my notes. I hope I don't No, it's not notes. bad, but it is a little distracting because we can yeah. see notes and the, the slides that are coming up. <laughs> All right, let me switch this. There All right, is that better? That's perfect, thank you. All right, well, thanks for the tech tip. Anyway, wanted to think a little bit about what is youth and uh, how we think about this developmentally vulnerable period in the lifespan. When I talk about youth or youths, I guess, as they say in Brooklyn, I'm thinking both about adolescence in the teen years, but also about young adults. And the issue is, What's the definition of adolescence? Does it end at 18, 21, 25, 45? It's not so much a bright line of a chronological age, right? We're talking about a continuum of development and maturity or immaturity as we might better think of it when we're speaking of risk and vulnerability. And so interested in young people, uh, both in the teenage years and through the early 20s. Also important to think about this issue of a generation gulf. Uh, many of you are certainly younger than me. Um, lots of you have experience with working with young people. Uh, many of you may have parented uh, teenagers. Some of you may have even been teenagers once upon a time. But the idea is that as we reach, maybe you're not as old as me, gray beard, but the idea being that the perspective of looking back at youth and caricaturizing risk across uh, this age and developmental group has both kernels of truth, as I'll show you uh, as we talk today, but also can become exaggerated. So we want to be a little careful about getting up on our high horse and saying things like, young people don't understand the value of a dollar. When I was a boy, we had to walk uphill to school both ways in the snow. They don't know how good they have, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and think carefully about trying to bridge that gulf. We also want to think about the perspective of youth thinking about us as we try to guide them and give them advice. Their perspective that, oh, you people are old. Uh, you don't understand me. You don't know what I'm going through. You can't tell me what to do. I'm all grown up. Leave me alone. You know, so that that is part of the gulf. And I just want to show you this quote um, from a historic source that gives us a little bit of a caricature of this. Maybe I'm, it's a little overdone and maybe it's a little overcritical, but it captures a little bit the view that we have as adults of this risk period. We live in a decadent age. Young people no longer respect their parents. They are rude and impatient. They frequent taverns and have no self-respect. And this talks about risk, this talks about attitude, and it talks about substance use, right? So guesses, when do you think this is from? How far back do you have to reach here? At least 1800s. All right, I have an 1800s. What else you got? Ancient Greece. This year. This year, well, it could be this year. No, check it out. So, this has been going on a long time, and it's something that we have to contend to, and it's ob contend with, and it's obviously uh, important for our topic today. So he here's what we're going to focus on uh, today. Uh, I'll show you a little bit about the scope of the problem, some trends in who's using what. I'll give you a quick intro into the concept of what the ASAM criteria are, uh, what ESPERT is, so that that'll be a preview of some of the more uh, in-depth material that we'll cover uh, in future sessions. And as I said, we'll focus on developmental vulnerability. And I'm going to highlight two features of development, uh, one emotion regulation and the other executive function. These are things I'm sure you've heard about, but I want to talk about them um, in a perspective of psychology and neuroscience to give you a frame of uh, what it is under the hood with young people that might help un us understand what confers vulnerability. And then, as I said, progression from use to use disorder and addiction. What are the gateways and mechanisms for progression? By the way, uh, as we go on today, just a word about uh, the material. I I've tried to target the non-specialist here, 
uh, in our work, um, and it's an overview of a lot of material. So for those of you who already have a great deal of experience uh, and we're hoping for the deep dive graduate course, this might at some times seem a little oversimplistic, my apologies. And then on the other side, uh, those of you who don't know any of this and have had no exposure to issues of substance use and substance use disorder, my apologies if it uh, goes a little too quick without enough uh, explanation, but trying to hit a middle ground. So let's, let's start with scope of the problem, trends in use. This is a look at the relationship between use and age over the lifespan. So we're looking at past month use. That's not necessarily disorder or addiction, but it does give us a lens into approximate rates of current use. And you'll notice that on the left, uh, the time is expanded so that we have the second decade of life blown up. And on the right, the rest of the lifespan is condensed. And that's because on the left side, that's where the action is, right? That's the ascending limb of the curve. And you can see that substance use for alcohol, tobacco, binge alcohol, any illicit drug, and for cannabis, all the same shape of the curve, but maybe different magnitudes. Uh, Initiation happens during the second decade of life and peak prevalence of use occurs at the end of the second decade of life and the beginning of the third decade of life. So uh, in young adulthood. And it's not that people on the right-hand side of the curve aren't using substances, plenty of them are, but when do you think they got started, right? We know that 90-ish percent of people who have persistent substance use disorders into adulthood developed that here's a look at lifetime use in US 12th graders the data is a little old but it reflects current trends as well you'll see progression uh, over a couple of decades and you can see alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, and illicit substances. And there's a number of instructive points here. One is that alcohol is the most prevalent substance uh, used by adolescents, not so surprising. Uh, and another thing that you see is the public health victory that we've had over not just the past couple of decades, but if the graph went further back uh, over half a century, you'd see the precipitous decline in the use of smoking cigarettes. Uh, unfortunately, we started in recent years to have a little bit of an uptick with e-cigarettes and vaping, but overall, somehow we've made cigarette smoking not as cool. That's a big public health victory. You see that about half of 12th graders have tried cannabis, so lots of them are using cannabis or have tried cannabis. Remember, this is lifetime use. This doesn't tell us current use or problem use. And then much lower rates of illicit drug use, but still alarming at 20%. Now, when you think about the difference between lifetime use, that is ever having tried, and current use, those rates are typically about half of the lifetime rates of use. So if or, or, or sometimes a third. So if you see that 45% or 50% of 12th graders have initiated or tried cannabis, about 20% of them have used in the past month more a reflection of uh, current use. Now let's flip that on its head. That last graph was use. Let's talk about non-use. So same information, but presented as the reciprocal. And this is more updated data. Uh, so you can see that the, that the trends are similar. And I wanna call your attention to a couple of lines. Look at cannabis. You'll see that, uh, as I said before, about half of 12th graders have had lifetime use of cannabis. But what is it that young people say to you when you draw their attention to what you think are problems with their excessive cannabis use? They say, ah, it's no big deal. Cannabis isn't really a drug and everybody's doing it. Well, is that true? And this data shows us not so fast. Certainly lots of young people 
have used cannabis, half of them, but that means half of them have not used cannabis. That comes as a surprise to people. I'd also like to draw your attention to the bottom line for all substances, right? So here we see that fully a third of young people have never tried, of 12th graders, have never tried alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, or other substances. That's quite surprising to a lot of people. Now, that means two thirds of them have, but a third of them have never tried. And those rates are increasing over time. So there is some good news there, right? Uh, in the bad news uh, of problems and vulnerability, overall, there is an incremental and gradual trend towards greater numbers of young people not initiating. On the other hand, there's probably a bifurcation that is increasing that among those that are using, many are using more and at greater rates and with higher potency and with more problems. So important to see both sides of that. All right, so now let's talk briefly about uh, the ASAM criteria, what it is. Uh, my apologies if it's oversimplified to those who already know that. The ASAM criteria, uh, which has been around now for about three decades, is a central component of the generally accepted standard of care in substance use treatment and uh, has a number of important functions. And one of which, maybe it's most important, is as a guide to organizing assessment assessment of risk, assessment of severity, assessment uh, that takes the standard clinical history of a person's current substance use and mental health problems and home problems and health history and organizes it into these six assessment dimensions in a way that makes focusing in on addressing severity in these six assessment dimensions more readily organized in a way that can move us forward to address particular problems in these six prob key problem areas. Now, are they exactly the right six assessment dimensions? Should it be five? Should it be seven? I don't know. That's a detail. There are other schemes that are out there. But this one uh, has, over time, by consensus, been adopted really as the standard. And those six assessment dimensions, as you may know, are uh, dimension one, intoxication and withdrawal. That's about acute intoxication. What are the effect of the substances on a person who's using? And importantly, what happens when they stop suddenly and do they get sick? Do they have withdrawal symptoms and what uh, might need to be done about it? Number two is biomedical conditions. That's both background health problems that a person might have, which might uh, impact on their substance use might be exacerbated on the substance use and importantly might be health conditions that are directly caused by the toxicity of substance use. Third, obviously very important in young people is the dual diagnosis or the co-occurring dimension, emotional, behavioral, and cognitive conditions, both pre-existing and those caused by substances as we'll talk about when we talk about co-occurring disorders. Most typically the mutual exacerbation of the two pre-existing conditions and substance use and how they interact with each other. Dimension four is readiness to change, treatment readiness, treatment motivation, obviously very, very important. Dimension five is relapse risk or continued risk of use or continued problems in other dimensions, for example, ongoing problems in mental health. So there's an interaction between the different dimensions here between dimension five and dimension three, if we're talking about risk of reoccurrence of mental health problems. And then dimension six, the recovery environment. Where's a person living? What's the influence of their family, their peers, their neighborhood, uh, et cetera? And what's the impact on the likely trajectory of their use and recovery? Then the ASAM divides treatment into levels of care. Uh, they do that in a schemata, both for adults and adolescents. This is the adolescent levels of care. And you can see how they progress uh, from the least intensive early intervention in outpatient to intensive outpatient to residential inpatient and to then uh, full hospitalization. 
And across this continuum of care, the idea is to articulate what the differences in each level of care are, what the basic uh, elements of staffing and treatment uh, coordination and treatment components are, obviously with variation that is both based on regulation and in individual uh, regions and also on the individual characteristics of programs, but the broad framework. And then the next step is to take assessment severity and treatment levels of care and put it together in this matching grid. And this is just a cartoon, a brief kind of uh, overview, oversimplified description of the material in the in the ASAM criteria, which goes on for hundreds of pages. But this notion that um, in the red along the left, you've got the different assessment dimensions with increasing severity of the assessment material as you move across to the right and across the top in the blue, you've got different levels of care and taking material about an individual person, individual patient, finding out what are the details of the severity and based on that, what are the treatment needs and based on that, what is the appropriate treatment plan to address severity in each of those dimensions. And based on that, where should the person go? What are the appropriate decision placements that could fulfill the needs of that treatment plan, which fulfill the needs of addressing severity in those assessment dimensions. So that's the brief overview. Uh, we'll get more into the weeds uh, in our session four when we go through uh, some scenarios and some cases that explore treatment matching strategies. A brief overview of ESPERT, which is central to our material, a core concept in delivering services, especially to young people. ESPERT, as we said, stands for screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. And the idea is, again, similar to the idea of the ASAM placement criteria, that we're going to match interventions to particular severity. And so, thinking about, say, a general healthcare setting or a general social services setting or a juvenile justice setting uh, in which it is not specialty substance use disorder treatment. Uh, we might do screening as a beginning, finding out who's using, who's using what, uh, how much, and in that information, then those that screen positive for some use do further assessment to establish the details of severity. And then as we categorize them, those who are reporting no use, we give them encouragement and cheerleading and positive reinforcement. Those that are reporting early initiation and experimental use but not yet progress to the point of use disorder. We give them brief advice about prevention and hopefully changing the trajectory and not progressing. For those that already have mild to moderate disorder with some amount of progression and some amount of functional impairment, we use brief motivational interventions to see if that kind of interaction where therapeutic alliance and getting to know a person and using motivational interviewing or motivational enhancement therapy, uh, meeting people where they are in a brief way can change the trajectory. And there's certainly good evidence in youth that that can be effective. And then for those that have severe or non-treatment responsive substance use disorder on the other end of the spectrum, uh, they may need referral to specialty treatment. And we'll cover all of these uh, in the next two sessions as we get into the details. All right, so now let's talk about developmental vulnerability. Here's a view of adult problem status based on age of initiation. So for these three substances, tobacco, alcohol, and cannabis, looking at what are the rates of adults who've developed a problem, in this particular study, problem status was defined as having one or more dsm 4 dependence criteria. You could measure it, slice it, and dice it in different kinds of ways. This is what these uh, researchers used. And looking at those rates of problem status as an adult, looking backwards 
at age of initiation. So divided into these three categories, initiation before the age of 14, initiation between 15 and 17, initiation after 17. And as you can see, just those three or four short years, a brief chronological period, though for adolescents, that's a lot of developmental water under the bridge, right? But the difference between under 14 and over 17 initiation conferring between a twofold and an eightfold increase in risk of developing problem status as an adult. And if you look across the top at for three substances, the risk of problem with initiation under 14, you see you're around 25% for all three substances. Now, I don't want to exaggerate, it's not 100%, but 25% risk of problem status because of initiation early is a big deal. Now, we see that early age confers risk. What about context? So you may have heard uh, people say, well, it matters where they use or how they use. And our society has contextualized use in a problem punitive way. We force it underground. We cause them to be sneaky. Of course, they binge use and use too much and get out of control because we haven't shown them appropriate measured controlled use, right? And so we should teach them to drink at home. We should have uh, school sponsored, normalized uh, events. Uh, how many of you have heard parents say, well, I want them uh, to learn how to drink at home responsibly where they can see how it's done. When we did it when we were kids and it didn't kill us, so what's the big deal? Have you heard that before? Sure. And um, what do you think the notion there is? What do you think the data tells us? Do people who have earlier exposure but in measured responsible ways uh, do significantly better? And Probably. the answer is clearly no. Oh. Uh, here, here's just one piece of data uh, that reminds us of this. This is an examination of how long it takes from first use to stabilization or recovery defined as one or more years of abstinence uh, in the community. Looking back at age of first initiation divided into initiation under the age of 15, initiation between 15 and 21, or initiation over uh, 21. And first thing that's important to know, right, is that not everybody ever gets well, right? Some people keep doing this through a lifetime, some people die of it, but lots and lots of people get well, right? That's the optimistic message. But prognosis is poorer across the board for those that initiate early. If you look across the median 50% split here, use under the initiation under the age of 15 increases the time it takes to get stable by 60%. So it is not a good idea to do early exposure. It is not a good idea to say we're going to teach them how to do it. The best approach, and of course, it's hard to teach parents about this, especially in our current culture that celebrates intoxication. But the appropriate message is that the right amount of use under the age of 21 is zero. People should postpone use and that improves prognosis. What is it about young people that makes them more vulnerable? Let's take a little bit of a look under the hood, not that we know the exact answer, uh, but we've got some emerging information from psychology and uh, brain development science uh, and other angles of inquiry. Not surprisingly, this is a time of considerable change, right? People uh, in their teen years and into young adulthood are changing rapidly, mind, brain, body, spirit, social interactions, all of those things are dynamic and uh, changing quite a bit. You can see in the cartoon, uh, one view of the change in brain composition uh, over the first two decades of life. This uh, is a reflection of an increase in a kind of brain constituent called white matter and a decrease in a kind of a brain constituent called gray matter. 
Uh, I won't bore you with the um, details, but it's just a reflection to show that brains are changing well into a person's 20s and changing in ways that have considerable functional implications. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and neuroscience helps us understand uh, some of the mechanisms of how structure and function are both interrelated and changing and in their immaturity uh, confer vulnerability. So we already said early substance use uh, carries a high risk of loss of control and development of a disorder. And you know some of these features, right? Adolescents are impulsive and more excitement seeking. They have more difficulty in delaying gratification. And as we'll talk about uh, in a little bit of detail, uh, they have poorer executive function and inhibitory control, less breaks, more go uh, than adults do. And those are some of the concepts that we understand in thinking about um, adolescent risk. Important, this concept of the interaction between structure and function. This was an enormous breakthrough in neurology from a couple of centuries, a century and a half ago. On the left, you see um, the connection along the motor strip, which is the part of the cerebral cortex that controls motor activity, right side of the brain controlling left half of the body, left side of the brain controlling right side of the body. And it's an illustration of one of the concepts of structure function interaction that we understand the best. So here is a cartoon picture of the part of the brain that is the geography, the location of the clump of nerve cells in that particular part of the cerebral cortex, the circuitry located there and how it maps to the control of a particular part of the body. You can see that there's a particular part of the body that controls the toes, a particular, a particular part of the brain that controls motor activity of the toes, a particular part that controls the face or the lips. There uh, are different sizes of how much brain it does to control parts that need more fine motor movement. For example, hands are a posable thumb. All of these things take up lots of brain space, brain circuitry. And while we don't have as much information about what are much more complicated matters of brain function like emotion, decision-making, we have some, and this analogy of the co-location of structure and function is a, a, a critical concept and it relates to the picture on the right which shows some of the other brain regions and some of the functional uh, attributes that they control, uh, physical coordination located in the cerebellum, emotion uh, in the amygdala, uh, judgment and uh, future oriented strategy in the prefrontal cortex where um, executive function goes. And important to know that there is a characteristic pre-hardwired cascade of typical development from the back to the front. So the areas at the front, both in terms of their structure and geography and in terms of the functions they control are the last to come online, the last to mature, the last to develop. And the prefrontal cortex with its control of executive function, which we'll talk about, is slow to mature, not fully formed well into the mid twenties so that when we think about adolescents, they are not fully baked and ready to come out of the oven. And so we shouldn't be surprised that some of their higher order uh, nuanced difficulties or abilities in emotion regulation and executive function are immature compared to adults. Why do we care about self-regulation? Because it is key in the pursuit of self-directed intention to improve function and health. So as these attributes in emotion regulation and executive function, which are the two things that we'll focus on, uh, mature, individuals are better able to make good choices about the future in strategic, complicated, nuanced ways that will improve their health. And teens don't have that as well developed. And thinking about that in relation to substance use, one particularly important paradigm is the paradigm of temptation and its resistance. So substances, among other 
risk behaviors are out there in the environment as temptations. And what is it that enables us as mature adults to be able to pick and choose, to parse temptation, to delay gratification as necessary in order to achieve self-directed future goals? And what is it about those things that young people aren't as well able to do? And then reciprocally, at baseline, they're less well able to do them, but add substances to the sauce, and those things are even further impaired. So these two things that we'll talk about, emotion regulation and executive function, to start with emotion regulation, this is housed largely in the amygdala. This is later to come on board, but certainly something that we see dynamically active during adolescence. And it's a marvelous time of life, right? And it's so wonderful to see young people uh, sprout their emotional interests and the vibrancy of their connections. Uh, they think they've discovered their feelings for the first time in history. It's a time during the lifespan where emotions are most salient and have the highest magnitude. Certainly there's lots of inter-individual variation. Some people are more emotional, other people are less emotional, but everybody is most emotional uh, at this time in the lifespan. And adolescents are discovering their feelings. Uh, they say to their parents, you, don't, you have no idea, you can't imagine how I'm feeling. Uh, you don't know what it's like to be in love. You, you don't know what it's like to discover peer loyalty. You, you don't know about social justice, the way it affects me and my friends. And it's marvelous to see it. They, each generation discovers these things anew as if they didn't exist before. And they also not only have high magnitude and high salient uh, emotions, that is they drive, when I say salience, they drive with their feelings rather than driving with their thinking. But they also have a sense of emotional insight, don't they? Uh, they uh, think that they understand people, they're journaling, they're writing poetry, they're discovering uh, all of these insights about the human soul. But is that for real? Are they really emotional experts? So here's just one kind of experiment from among many that evil psychologist experimenters uh, have, uh, talk about the ability to appreciate or identify or empathize with another person's emotional state, right? That's one measure of how rich a person's emotional exploration might be. And you ask a bunch of adults, what emotion is this person expressing? And what, what would you say? What would most people say? This person is feeling what? So most people will say fear. Like fear. That's, that's exactly right. In an average group of mature adults, most people say fear. Some people might say disgust. Some people might say shock. But fear is generally what most people will say. And if you ask a bunch of adolescents, or surprise, that's right. Oh, if you ask a bunch of adolescents, what will they say? Same thing? They'll typically say angry. Yes, correct. I agree. They'll typically say angry. And it, this phenomenon of attributing negative emotions and emotional hostility in the environment is, characteristics, is, is characteristic of young people. And it's not just that they're being ornery knuckleheads. Yeah, maybe on some days they're being ornery knuckleheads, but it is hardwired into their level of emotional regulation, maturation, or immaturation. So it shouldn't surprise us, right, when a young person says to their mom, you've ruined my life. Only once today, it's a good day. They see the world in that way. And so part of the real deal of adolescent emotion regulation is that there is a disconnect between their sense of enriched affective capacity and insight and its actual immaturity or even impairment compared to the fully robust adult state. They think they're emotional geniuses, but actually in many ways they're emotional morons. That needs to be incorporated, I think, into our understanding of risk. And if they tend to experience negative emotion and hostility in the environment at a disproportionate level and have more difficulty in managing their inner emotional state, controlling their inner emotional state as adults do, doing self-soothing, then won't they be more vulnerable 
to the use of other perhaps dangerous, less adaptive tools like intoxication to self-soothe and manage emotions. Not that adults don't do that. Many of us might have had the experience of wanting a drink at the end of a hard day. That's fine, but we don't do a lot of that. And we don't, those of us who don't have disorder, don't lose control and don't do it that often. But as it is a tool that young people get exposed to, it is incredibly reinforcing in this way because of their immaturity in having other mature tools to do emotion regulation and self-soothing. When you talk to the parents of young people who have developed substance use disorders, many of them will recognize this antecedent vulnerability in the kids from very early on. And when I say very early on, I mean like infancy, toddlerhood. Yeah, this kid, little Johnny, is different than his brothers or sisters. He was the kid that was more impulsive. He was the kid that was more tantrumy and moody. He was the kid that's always had poor frustration tolerance. He was the kid that's had a problem with irritability and anger. Not 100%. Anybody can develop a substance use disorder for sure. But the kids that have more trouble with emotion regulation, all kids have more trouble with emotion regulation than adults, but some kids worser than others. And those kids are more vulnerable. And there are some studies that can identify kids at risk because of problems with emotional regulation, say tantruming, even at six months who have higher rates of substance use disorder later in life at the period of exposure. So again, as I say, this is not a surprise. We need to take into account this stance, this negative perception of hostility and digging your heels in and fighting as part of the built-in vulnerability. Now let's talk about executive function, this second concept um, of um, developmental immaturity that uh, we should examine. Executive function is this higher order cognitive integrative ability, again, located at the front of the brain in the prefrontal cortex that allows us to do strategic Which planning for the future, days, put on the brakes, do inhibitory right control, to. delay gratification, think about the future. It's kind of an amazing gift that God gave us like a built-in time machine. We can read the future without having to rely just on personal past experience. I sometimes joke that executive function is the ability to avoid being eaten by a tiger without actually having had to have the personal experience of previously being eaten by a tiger. Pretty cool, right? And higher primates have this, but humans especially, but as I say, it takes a while to develop. And it is underdeveloped in adolescence. They can't weigh priorities as well as adults. They can't plan ahead. They are unable to exhibit inhibitory control, so they end up looking disinhibited. They are disinhibited. They do the first thing that comes across their mind. They do things that are immediate gratification oriented rather than future oriented. And we sometimes talk about them all, all acceleration, no brakes. I want to draw your attention to an example of executive control in a famous psychology experiment that has become now known as the Stanford Marshmallow Experiment, an important uh, work first done in the 70s at Stanford by uh, famous psychologist Walter Michel. And many of you will have seen this. I'm going to show you a little video because uh, I think it illustrates it nicely and it's cute and funny. But the basic idea is you put a bunch of five or six year olds in a room and you say to them, uh, here's a marshmallow. You want a marshmallow? And not every kid likes marshmallows, but lots of kids like marshmallows. And you say, you can eat it, but if you don't eat it, I'd like you to wait five minutes, not eat it. And if you don't eat it for five minutes, I'll give you two. So it's a nice measure of delaying gratification, exerting executive function inhibitory control for a future goal. So let's see if we can get this video to go. <laughs> <laughs> 
Sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? All right. And you can intuit, right, from their expressions what must be going on between their ears, right? It's so tempting. I'm going to go do something, and then I'll come back. It's yummy, yummy. It's really good. Exploring it, smelling it, isn't it? Doesn't it look delicious? <laughs> Let your fingers do the walking. I want to, I don't want to, I want to, I don't want to. A little distraction. No, oh, no, no. Distracting Watch themselves. Stay in the chair, okay? Okay. Pretend eating. A little nibble. Who will notice? <laughs> Give it a kiss. <laughs> They'll never know. All right, so I'm gonna leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait, either way, okay? Okay. What do you mean wait? Forget you, lady. She's in trouble. So funny to watch and marvelous how transparent um, they are. And we can all, I think, appreciate the workings of some, none, want it, don't want it, approach, avoidance, right? And, and that, that transparency in, in these youngsters is, is rich and wonderful. But it's actually a, a very profound experiment that has been now replicated again and again by graduate students and researchers across the globe in every country in every socioeconomic class in every race, et cetera, et cetera. And what's instructive about it is the risk that is conferred by the variability, the dimensional variability of different degrees of inhibitory executive control. Being able to resist temptation to a marshmallow for just five minutes actually turns out to be very highly correlated with a lot of important functional outcomes. And that makes sense, right? What's important at five might be different than what's important at 10 and at 15 and at 30. But the idea is that being able to exert executive control is really important in terms of being able to achieve future goals through postponement of gratification. And examples of that include that performance on this test are correlated with academic achievement in uh, middle school, high school, uh, high school graduation rates, college entrance rates, college GPA, college graduation, adult levels of employment, adult levels of salary. For our purposes, highly correlated with development of initiation of substance use at teenage years of exposure and of progression to loss of control, escalation, and substance use disorder 
persistence into adulthood and on and on. Now, I don't want to exaggerate. Uh, this is not fate. It's not one bite of a marshmallow and you're doomed forever. People change, people mature, uh, all of that. Um, and it's by no means 100%. But again, I think instructive about what immaturity in executive function means in terms of vulnerability. If we did this with teenagers, maybe it wouldn't be the marshmallow test, maybe it would be the pizza test, but we see some of the same kinds of attributes of immature youth in being vulnerable to temptation. Now let's look at some other ways of measuring or having a lens on executive function. Uh, oh, before we do that, I, I just wanna talk about environmental exposure and temptation. You know, one of the things that teens have to contend with in our culture is these icons of the celebration of substance use. And intoxication and substances are linked in our culture with the good life and achievement and having arrived. And that is increasingly pervasive in a way that's very difficult for uh, teens to resist, especially if they have immaturity of executive function as we know they do. All right, quick, name the color in the upper left-hand corner. Yellow. Right, so it's actually red. And this is called the Stroop test, invented by the evil Dr. Stroop. And it's one of any number of tests of aspects of executive function. And the key is that there is a two signal interference task, right? You got two informational signals, one, the color itself, and the other, the verbal name of the color, the written name of the color. And here we've had the information contradictory. So in order to do this, you gotta slow down, think about the rule, not blurt out the first thing that comes into your mind, process, wait, what did he say? The color, the name of the color, right? And even for mature adults, most people don't get this right 100% of the time, but adults do better across the board than adolescents. Substance using adolescents, even worse. But again, a notion of how do you contend with competing information from the environment across multiple inputs and senses and integrate that into strategic planning for the future. And this is just two competing signals. Life its own self, right, is an infinite number of signals and therefore, as you might imagine, hard for young people to contend with. Here's another measure of executive control. Uh, other evil psychologists do experiments on this concept called delayed discounting. This is the idea of What's the value of a reward in real time now immediately versus how much less is that reward worth in the future? And if you're a nerdy accountant and live your life by spreadsheets, which most of us may not, there is a calculated answer that has to do with the present value of money and current interest rates and that kind of stuff, right? And, but most of us have an emotional component to the salience of reward, and this can be measured. You ask people, uh, would you rather have X today or X plus Y tomorrow, next week, next year? Now, the difference between $100 now or a million dollars next year might be obvious. Most people would say, yeah, I'll wait a year for a million dollars. That's huge magnitude, right? Okay, but what about $100 today versus $150 next year? With current interest rates, even with inflation, the spreadsheet would tell you you ought to do that. On the other hand, no, I want it now. I'm not going to wait around. I'm not sure I trust you to fulfill your end of the bargain a year from now. Who are you anyway? You know, all of those kinds of things. And I want what I want when I want it. And so you can find a quantitative cut point versus how long people are willing to wait. And adolescents tend to discount the delay more than adults. 
They are less willing to wait for results, for rewards. People who use substances also discount delay more than people who don't use. And adolescents with substance use, that's a double whammy. Again, another lens into immaturity of executive control. A nice historical example that many of you may have heard about was one of the first times that neurologists put together the structure function connection between the location of executive function in the prefrontal cortex. And there was this guy, Phineas Gage, who was a railway worker and there was a tragic accident and an explosion and this railway pike was blown through his skull. And here's a picture of him holding the railway pike as he became famous afterwards and a cartoon of it going through his skull. And he was miraculously spared death and there was no loss of motor function. It seemed like he'd gone unscathed and was normal. You know, a millimeter to the right, a millimeter to the left, it would have been curtains, but it didn't get uh, vital breathing spots. It got this narrow uh, brain tissue in the prefrontal cortex, but in future years, his personality started to degrade. And uh, he, this is this quote from um, a guy named Harlow, who was the neurologist who made his career uh, on describing this case. He says that Gage became fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity, manifesting but little deference for his fellows, impatient of restraint or advice when it conflicts with his desires, at times pertinaciously obstinate, say that five times fast, yet capricious and vacillating, devising many plans of future, future operations which are no sooner arranged than they are abandoned. Remind you of any teenagers? Again, this is a particular uh, example from damage to the prefrontal cortex, but some of those same features are manifest with immaturity or not yet fully developed executive function from the prefrontal cortex. Again, another lens onto what we've learned about these matters. All right, so we'll take a break in just a couple of minutes, but maybe let's do some Q&A uh, on this morning's material, have some discussion, then we'll take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and talk about the mechanisms of disorder and progression. Um, so I'm seeing one question, are there trends in, oops, it just changed, hold on, scroll back up. Here we go, are there trends in different states um, where cannabis has been legalized or decriminalized? Very interesting. We're in the middle, obviously, of a natural experiment um, that uh, I wouldn't have asked for or designed, but it is happening. And we're seeing decreased restrictions in access to cannabis, uh, mostly targeted adults, but you're not surprised that it gets into uh, adolescent hands, either because of diversion or even in some places uh, where access is not that well controlled or enforced or where excuse me, there may be um, indications for so-called medical cannabis for young people. And what we're seeing is that there is increased use by young people in states where restriction is decreased. Uh, that data is early, it's not definitive, you know, we need to see future years, but that's the, the trend so far. And that's not surprising, right? We know that there is a pretty tight correlation between access and use across all cultures, across all regulation, and across all substances. Uh, prohibition, for example, uh, in the states uh, in, in the 1920s was such an experiment. It was a failed experiment. Uh, in many ways, not great public policy and its implementation, you could argue, was bungled. But one thing that did happen is as access to alcohol was decreased, use of alcohol went down. It's 
that's not controversial. It's black and white. And with decreased use comes decreased problem use because some subset of people who use, who now use less, will have less problems. Now, you may argue that it's bad policy because it creates a gangster class of Al Capones, et cetera, et cetera, but it does decrease use and decrease problem use. If you look across cultures um, at rates of alcohol correlated to restrictions on access, the, the, the same cross-cultural trend is clear. Uh, look at places like France where wine is served at the dinner table to toddlers, there are higher rates of alcohol use and of alcohol use problems. It's even worse in Russia where vodka is served at the dinner table in babies' bottles. I'm exaggerating, but maybe not much. And on the other hand, if you look at cultures where there is restriction, say Saudi Arabia, where there are legal and religious prohibitions, there are far lower rates of use, not zero, some people are perfectly willing to break the law, but there are lower rates of use and lower rates of problem use. So access is instrumental. And by the way, that leads us to policy implications about effective access modulating regulatory steps like taxes, decrease use of alcohol and tobacco, changing the hours and locations of operation of liquor stores and bars, is a very effective way of decreasing access, et cetera, et cetera. So we're, we're yet to see what the longer term downstream effects are for decreased restrictions on cannabis in functional outcomes, but we're already seeing the early returns on increased use, so stay tuned. I think I recall research suggesting that having a more developed emotional vocabulary early on predicts increased mood regulation and healthier behavior. No, that's right. Um, now, those kinds of longitudinal studies are hard to do because you've got to look at young people for 10 years and it's hard to get grants that last that long, but you're absolutely right. One lens onto emotion regulation is the ability, for example, to articulate and identify in the inner world introspectively what a person's feeling. That's one of the reasons why that's entered the common kind of kindergarten intervention and we put the different smiley faces, frowny faces on the refrigerator and that's become a tool for parenting and kindergarten teachers with the notion that if we can teach young people to articulate and identify emotions, they can get better mastery. So th that seems to be the case. What protective factors can mitigate developmental immaturity? That's a great question. And there has been a lot of robust work in that. And it doesn't just pertain to substance use, although it certainly does pertain to substance use. So things that we do to enrich opportunities for learning in young people are very important. Things that we do to enrich nutritional assets in young people. This is the basis of programs like Head Start that you know about that have good evidence base behind them. Um, enriching parental and other family interactions with young people, creating supportive environments in which alternative pathways to gratification, pleasure, and self-soothing give success. So the standard stuff that you hear, have dinner with your kids, read to your kids, school support things, all of those things are based on the concept that they build the rates of maturation of both emotion regulation, executive function, but also something that I haven't talked as much about, but is very important, is building a network of social supports that reinforce resilience, right? And this is one of the places in which socioeconomic status does play a big role. Families that have assets, families that have access to the richness of the web of human opportunities in work and school and leisure and cultural enrichment have an advantage because all of those things are protected. And those are things that we can do something about in terms of at least 
in my view, maybe I shouldn't be going political here, but if we can broaden those assets for everyone, uh, I think we, we do the society a great service. Somebody asked a question about ADHD. Let's postpone that to, um, I think, session three when we're talking about co-occurring disorders. And here's somebody asking, I have a client who's asking if she can seek medical use for her child. Uh, we'll talk more about individual substances in session two, so hold that. Please remember to ask again, um, but I'll tell you the short answer. Wait, let me think about it. No, bad idea, but we'll talk about the details uh, about medical cannabis and what its possible indications are next time. All right, we're going on a bit long. Let's pause, take a break, come back in 10. Welcome back, everyone. Um, and I, I like the one donut or two donut comments. It's good to have donuts either way. You're a grown up. You get to have dessert first, right? I wanted to, before we get going, though, I, I wanted to bring your attention to what I thought was a very interesting comment in the chat. Somebody uh, drew our attention to a Bible verse, Romans 5, chapters, I mean, verses three through five, and not being as much of a biblical scholar as I might like, I had to look it up. Uh, those of you who, who don't know it, the key is, the message is that suffering produces perseverance. So I, I think that uh, the person who posted that comment was reminding us that one of the things that happens in maturation is that in a normative, resilient experience of growing up, we learn to tolerate frustrations. And in learning to tolerate the vicissitudes of the real world, which doesn't beckon to our every whim, we become stronger, learn to tolerate frustration, learn to plan for the future, and become stronger in our strategic planning. And I agree that that is a very nice model, or at least one model of an aspect of the maturation of executive function. But I want us to be careful about that and think about it in context, because we got to think about the dimensional variations in resilience. So who can tolerate what kind of suffering? And we need to think about the dimensional variations in the extremity of the suffering, right? So most of us are not as resilient as Job to, to stay in the Bible for a second. And that would swamp most people. So that kind of suffering is not necessarily helpful for maturation. And that might be a nice metaphor for some of why traumatic events and um, adverse childhood events are problematic for people if they cross a cumulative threshold of severity. So, you know, we don't want to just beat on children to help them grow up. That doesn't work so good. But then another issue is to think about who is more or less resilient. And in a perfect world, which of course we don't live in, we would be able to match the right amount of incremental environmental challenge with a young person's developmental capacity for resilience based on their state of maturation and help them learn just enough but not be overwhelmed. If only it were that easy, but it's an interesting perspective. So thanks, thanks for that comment. All right, so now let's talk about uh, progression from use to disorder. And the idea is we've talked about vulnerability to initiation of use and progression of use. Well, what constitutes the loss of control, the escalation? What are some of the mechanisms of use disorder? And how can we integrate what we've learned about a vulnerability into our understanding of how the whole addiction thing works? Uh, the first thing I wanna show you, this probably old hat for most of you, but just to define as DSM-5 currently does, what is a substance use disorder anyway? And these are the latest criteria. As I say, it's DSM-5, soon we'll be up to DSM-17 and a half, whatever. But the, the, the core concepts are, are constant. And here you have nine criteria um, that you'll be familiar with or will resonate, you know, using despite hazard, use that causes interpersonal and social problems, use that might entail tolerance and withdrawal, using more than you anticipated, having cravings, et cetera, et cetera. 
And uh, currently we grade severity based on the number of these criteria that you might have. Two or three of the nine gets you mild, four or five of the nine gets you moderate, more than six or more gets you severe. This, by the way, is a hypothetical scheme. We don't have enough longitudinal data to know whether this particular grading scheme really will turn out longitudinally to predict prognosis and treatment response trajectory. So stay tuned for future research, but it's at least got face validity and is compelling in the sense that it makes intuitive sense. So these are some of the features, but what causes that? After all, lots of people use substances, right? 80 plus percent of the American population, for example, has had lifetime experience of alcohol. But most people who use alcohol don't get into trouble with it. Uh, most people use a little, most people use now and again, a beer at a football game, a glass of wine with dinner, whatever, not loss of control, but a substantial subpopulation among mature adults, depending on who's doing the measuring, we think that's maybe 10 to 20% of people who use alcohol get into trouble with alcohol. Not everybody, not even most people, but we sure know how severe it can be. Intoxication seems, or the pursuit of intoxication and the rewards of, of being outside yourself, having a buzz experience, that euphoria seems to be something that is hardwired into human experience. Uh, you know, you've all seen two and three-year-olds spin around to get dizzy long before they've been exposed to substances. Humans like that kind of thing. But where does it go awry for some people versus the majority? And how does that work? So I want to break it down into four components. Obviously, if I knew the answer to uh, what causes addiction and what makes it go, I win a big prize and a free trip to Stockholm. I, I don't know the answer, but here are some perspectives from current thinking um, in addiction science. And, and we're gonna talk about four components. They're not the only components, but they're four ones that um, you should all know about. One will be familiar to you. It's from the neurotransmitter dopamine theory 101, that there is a hardwired built-in reward system that substances hijack because they are a sledgehammer effect on the way that the mammalian brain works. A second one though that we'll talk about, which is just as important, maybe more important than not as many people know about is not so much the craving and pursuit of reward, it's the craving and pursuit of relief that is how not, not how you get high, but how you get less ill. And so we'll talk more about that. Uh, we'll talk about uh, executive function. We've already talked about that some, but I wanna make the point that it's not just a risk factor, but that substances actually degrade executive function. And lastly, um, moving away from the brain and into social experience, talking about the narrowed repertoire that people acquire over time as their opportunities degrade with continued substance use. So let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into those things. So starting with pursuit of high magnitude reward and problems with incentive salience. And salience is a word that we use a lot in um, uh, the study of motivation and addiction. It's you know what motivates you at the moment? What in the environment is the thing that you glom onto and makes you act. And substances tend to do a good job at that. Just a quick reminder from high school biology, uh, these are two brain cells called neurons. The space between them is called a synapse. And we have neurotransmitters, which are the chemicals that convey information from cell A to cell B. We have the presynaptic cell up on top then it spews out a neurotransmitter into the space between, into the synapse, and then it gloms on to a receptor on the postsynaptic cell, and that conveys an information, a piece of information. So cell number one says neurotransmitter in, it goes on to the receptor, the receptor says, ah, information on, and it makes me do something. And there are dozens if not hundreds of different neurotransmitters that do different things throughout the brain, different overlapping things. Acetylcholine is one of the ones that's very closely involved in motor uh, interactions and making muscles twitch. Dopamine is one that's, as you guys know, very associated with reward. 
and uh, reinforcement. It's not the only one, but it's the one that's most popular and certainly one that is involved in every substance of intoxication that we've so far discovered is mediated at least in part through dopamine. And so here, the orange, I don't know what that shape is. Is that a tetrahedron? I'm not sure what it is, but that orange shape is call it a, a dopamine molecule and it comes out of the presynaptic cell and then sits on the blue cones, which are, or blue rods, which are dopamine receptors. And it turns on the dopamine receptor and sends the signal to the next cell. But you can't, in order to have information, you have to have both an on signal and an off signal. And the way that works is that these red thingamajiggies are called the dopamine reuptake transporter so that after dopamine does its job, it's sucked back up, slurped back up into this cell to make the off signal so that you can throw it out again in the future to have an on signal when it's appropriate. So there's a regulation, more dopamine, less dopamine, more dopamine, less dopamine. So cocaine comes along and the way it works is it blocks the dopamine reuptake transporter. So now dopamine's not slurped back up. It sits in the synapse and the signal, instead of being a nuanced on, off, 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 on, on, off, off, it's on, 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 on. And that's why cocaine is so reinforcing because through this mechanism, it increases levels of dopamine. Now other substances do this as well, but maybe in less direct ways. Here's uh, the way it works for opioids. Now we've introduced a third neuron in the upper right. So uh, what happens is uh, opioids glom onto the opioid receptor. This cell turns on, this cell sends a signal here it's probably GABA or another neurotransmitter that's not uh, illustrated here. And that causes more release of dopamine. And so there's more on because this cell told this cell told this cell. Same thing for cannabis. By now, many of you will know, but maybe not everybody, God gave us a THC receptor, presumably not so we could be better cannabis addicts, but to do the things that a built-in substance that turns on the cannabis receptor for 10 points called anandamide. And it mediates pain relief, mediates reward. Strangely enough, there are THC receptors and activity of anandamide on bone cells and it mediates bone growth. Who knew? God was very clever in his design. Lots of crossover and interesting things. But anyway, what happens is again, THC sits on the THC receptor. This cell tells this cell to release more dopamine. This cell releases more dopamine and this cell gets the message on, 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 want more cannabis. And I could go on and on with alcohol and methamphetamine and benzos, et cetera, et cetera. But it's essentially similar variations on this theme, plus the complexity of other neurotransmitters. And then just to look at how this signal of increased dopamine conveys behavioral change in terms of incentive salience. The picture of the brain on the right just gives you a kind of a cartoon circuitry of some of the areas in which this happens in the middle of the brain in areas called the nucleus incumbens and the VTA or ventral tegmental area signaling to the frontal cortex and prefrontal cortex. And then looking at the micro level, look at this bottom graph. Here you have levels of dopamine in the brain. These aren't experiments that we do on humans. They're not even very nice when you do them on rats as pictured here, sticking electrodes into rat brains and measuring these things, but it teaches us a lot. And so we're chugging along at 100%. 100% means the typical level of dopamine as found in the resting state of this animal. And then you feed the animal, that is expose the animal to a very potent, highly motivating natural reward, rat chow. And what happens? their dopamine levels spike considerably. Here we have it in this example to 150% of the baseline rate. That's a big signal. I want more rat chow as communicated by, I got more dopamine as a currency of reward. Now give this animal methamphetamine. 
kapow. Instead of 150%, which would have been here, it's 1,000%. So this is just one illustration of that old saw that substances of intoxication are sledgehammers that hijack the built-in reward system. And no wonder mammalian brains, when exposed to intoxicating substances, not only like the subjective feeling that it gives them, but they are hardwired to be motivated to want more. And here's an example of doing this kind of experiment in a higher order primate. This is a baboon in a Skinner cage, and you can do the same kind of experiment. It's again, not very nice, but you can do this on baboons uh, by offering them different rewards and seeing how hard they will work for a particular reward. And you can measure that by how many times they'll press a lever or some other quantitative amount of work. And if you give them food, banana candy flakes or baboon chow or a toy or social interaction with another baboon, especially say a, a baboon um, who is sexually receptive versus other rewards focused on substances of intoxication. And so one of the things that we learn is that this baboon will work harder for an amphetamine or a cocaine reward than food or water when it's thirsty or access to another baboon. It's just, again, this hijacking sledgehammer phenomenon. And unlimited access to cocaine in a baboon is almost universally fatal. They will just keep going and don't know how to self-regulate until they've had so much that they've killed themselves. So fortunately, most humans don't have unlimited access to cocaine, but it's again illustrative of how hardwired this is. And that's an example, as you may remember from high school uh, psychology of operant conditioning, that is rat in the maze, learning how to run the maze for a cheese reward, right? Behavior shifts to get more of the appropriate reward. But there's also an important aspect of classical conditioning. That's also called Pavlovian conditioning. You remember that, the idea that if you can show a physiological response in Pavlov's famous experiment, it was the dog salivating in response to an environmental food cue. That's a normal hardwired kind of thing. Uh, you can then associate the natural stimulus the food with a new stimulus ringing Pavlov's bell, and that will eventually take over by associated learning or cue associated learning such that the dog will salivate just with the bell and you don't need any food to get the physiological response, right? So we see that in substance use disorder as it develops over time. And this particular experiment shows us the amygdala responding to a cocaine video far more than it responds to a nature video of you know cute puppies in someone who is a cocaine user. You get an emotional response and you don't even need the drug, just pictures of the drug, a video of the drug, a memory of the drug, persons, places, and things associated with the drug are enough to drive the motivation, cause a dopamine spike, and to drive behavior. All right, so that may be old hat to many of you, but again, just that refresher, that incentive salience of reward and craving associated, by the way, subjective craving, right, is the notion that says, I recognize that I want it. Uh, lots of people will act on these behaviors, not even recognizing that they have craving, but craving can be conscious or unconscious as manifested in changes in behavior. Now let's talk about, that was, that's positive reinforcement, right? Uh, and you remember the concept of negative reinforcement. That's not the same as punishment. Negative reinforcement is, positive reinforcement is a goodie that increases a certain behavior. Punishment is a baddie that decreases behavior. Negative reinforcement is removal of a baddie that increases the behavior. So relief, right? And relief may be in the form of as addiction progresses, people develop 
tolerance and dependence and may get withdrawal symptoms and they feel terrible and they use to avoid the feeling terrible. But it's not just physiological withdrawal. It may be any negative state, for example, a negative emotional state, anxiety, depression, the vicissitudes of life that we wish before, as we said, suffering produces perseverance. No, suffering may in some people who aren't resilient produce the pursuit of relief through intoxication. And those of you who have done clinical SUD work will know when you talk to patients, many of them, those who are advanced in their substance using careers uh, will say, I'm not even getting high anymore. This isn't that good anymore. I'm just trying to get well. And they will be chasing some nostalgic recollection of the first time or the first few times and can never get there, but a boy can dream, right? And the idea of wanting to recapture that, but being unable to capture that, and it's no longer about feeling good, it's about feeling less bad. And I just wanna show you this cartoon, it's a little complicated, uh, but I think it's illustrative of the notion of this concept that is about negative reinforcement and reward deficit. Over time, as people use, rewards become less high magnitude from substances, stress, becomes higher magnitude and the motivation becomes one of stress relief. So take the top left, uh, just as a cartoon of substance use and talk about state A as being intoxication, feeling good, getting high, having euphoria. You take the substance, you get this peak intoxication experience, it attenuates over time and then you kind of go back to normal or neutral. But you pass through neutral because the next day you're hungover, or the next day, by contrast, you're not feeling as good as you did during the peak intoxication experience, or you're regretful of what you did last night at the party and you're feeling guilty, but eventually that fades too and you're back to normal. Well, that's how it goes at first in experimentation before loss of control, before tolerance, before dependence, but over time, the Tolerance, as you know, is that the same amount of the substance doesn't give you as much of the intoxication effect, or another way of saying it is it takes more of the substance to get the same effect. Either way, different ways of saying the same thing. And over time, you can see on the top right that the intoxication experience has less magnitude. And it takes longer to get back to normal, but you still pass through normal to a negative experience and that negative experience has higher magnitude and takes longer to get back to normal. The hangover is worse, the regret is worse, the contrast with the intoxication or normal is a higher contrast. And then add that up over time and look at the bottom and this is kind of a time series progression that over time you see the attenuation the diminution of the intoxication experience A and the enlargement of the recovery or negative experience B. And you can see that normal is sloping downwards, right? Normal becomes the new normal, which is worserer and worserer. And again, corresponding with the subjective experience of, I'm not feeling that good, but it's the only thing I can do to feel less bad. And think of that baboon in the cage. You're just pushing that same button to get a thing that's not working as well. But because of the sledgehammer effect, it works better than anything else because it outstrips the normal environmental rewards, right? It's better than the other things that used to float your boat. It's better than a cheeseburger. It's better than homework. It's better than a job well done at, at work. It's better than love and sex because over time, it's separating increasingly from normal environmental reward producing stimuli, but it's never good enough. So you keep pushing it harder. And there is some understanding of the black box of mechanism of what causes that. And at least one theory and part of the story is it actually changes the capacity of the dopamine circuitry, the dopamine receptor itself to respond to rewards. And so reward systems themselves degrade and break, if you will, over time, the more you use. And here's a cartoon picture of how that changes in different substance users with an imaging study. 
and in a schematic of fewer expressed dopamine receptors. We talk about this as a shift in hedonic capacity, right? That's just a fancy Greek word for the experience of pleasure and interest. Over time, people who continue to use substances have less capacity for pleasure from normal environmental stimuli, but from substances also. And so anhedonia, the decreased experience of interest and pleasure, is a, a near universal feature of the progression of substance use disorder. And by the way, that should remind you of another psychiatric mental health problem, right? Sounds like major depression, doesn't it? And it might be that there are overlapping mechanisms and it's no wonder, and we'll talk more about this when we talk about co-occurring disorders, it's no wonder that so many people with substance use problems have depression or have something that's very much like depression or indistinguishable from depression. And then that of course makes them want to seek relief even more because less and less is working. All right, number three, the idea of the impairment of cognitive executive control. And we've talked a bunch about executive control, so I won't belabor that, but just to make the point that what we've been talking about so far is baseline variation, both about age-related immaturity and inter-individual variation, the less executive function maturity you have, the more you're at risk. But I also wanna add that there is a direct toxicity in ways that we don't really understand. No matter where you started, no matter how mature in your executive inhibitory control and executive function you were, the more you use, the worse it gets as measured by any of the tests we saw, as measured by delay discounting, as measured by the Stroop, as measured by the marshmallow test. So use is bad for executive control. And if you started out immature and then you get more immature, if that's a word, that's a double whammy. And then I wanna talk about this last facet on our list, narrowed repertoire of functional experiences and constrained opportunities. And here's a cartoon that tells a little bit of the story. If you think about our rich, average, human experience, most of us have a lot of irons in the fire, in our interests, in our function, in our pleasure, in our connections with the environment. And this is just illustrations of some of the biggies, right? Family and romantic love and work and school and athletics and leisure pursuits and motivation and ambition and you know hundreds of others that you can name music art you know whatever floats your boat and most of us have a lot of things that float our boat and that may change with experience and that may change from culture to culture and that may change with maturity but we all have those things and those are aspects of rich human experience and of our resilience but people who use substances progressively with loss of control and the development of disorder start to lose these things, both because of the mechanism I talked about, because their reward system is degraded and even broken. They develop anhedonia and these things are no longer as rewarding, both in general and certainly by contrast with the sledgehammer hijacking of substances. But less well recognized is also that this is a two-way street with the environment. There is a reciprocal interaction with the environment. It's not just that the substance user or the substance use disordered person loses interest in the environment. The environment loses interest in that person. And although they're no longer interested in knocking on the doors of function and connection human interaction and pleasure, even if they do knock on that door, what happens? It doesn't get opened as much. In fact, it often gets slammed shut on their face because who wants to hire that person? Who wants to be in love and have a relationship with that person? Who wants to deal with the lying, the difficulties, et cetera? And so there is this reciprocal interaction in which opportunity, connection, 
and function is constrained in both directions and it's a self-perpetuating cycle. I don't mean to be all doom and gloom. Treatment gets people out of this and we'll talk that about that when we get to treatment, but it is a deep hole and the deeper you dig, the deeper you dig, right? And back to our baboon in the cage, a lot of it is the operant and classical conditioning and the sledgehammer, but a lot of it is the cage. So this animal, just by metaphor, only has the one button to push because he is enslaved in a paradigm of there's nothing else for him. Now that's a cheap metaphor, my apologies, but I think it illustrates this point of constrained opportunity. All right. We're almost at the hour, so let's take some time for questions and discussion. And then of course, we'll come back next time and talk about part two. So somebody said, trying to avoid being dope sick is a major motivator for continued use. That's absolutely right. Those of you who don't know the jargon, dope sick is a word that opioid users will uh, use to describe the experience of opioid withdrawal. Again, saying things like, it's, I, I'm just trying to get well, alleviate withdrawal. What are the statistics for those with SUD also being diagnosed with major depressive disorder or some type of depressive disorder? We'll talk more about that with co-occurring disorders, uh, but it's easily uh, up to a third. It depends on who's doing the measuring. Uh, which comes first, chicken or egg, is an interesting question, which we'll talk more about. What else? Page 123 in the AA book mentions a study that was done that found that alcoholics have common traits of being emotionally sensitive, childish, and grandiose. I think perhaps starting use early can lead to never developing the skills because problems are met with a numbing substance rather than trying to solve the problem. So that's interesting. Um, that's an oversimplification, emotionally sensitive, childish, and grandiose, but it's got a kernel of accuracy describing some of the same features of immaturity in emotion regulation and executive function that we've been talking about. And it works in both ways. People who have greater degrees of that immaturity are more likely to later develop substance use initiation, progression and persistence of disorder. And no matter where you start out, substances degrade maturity and especially early derail the development of those skills, just as this person says. So I agree. Other points, other questions. Here's, here's a point that, um, that resonates on the constrained opportunities and the metaphor of the baboon in the cage being enslaved, and they make the reference to implications for people of color in our society. I think that's absolutely right. And broadly thinking about baseline constraints on opportunity. So again, anybody that develops a substance use disorder develops constraints on opportunity and connectivity, but people who start out with disadvantage and deprivation, whether that's of poverty, or racism, or uh, cultural deprivation, or educational deprivation, all of those things confer additional risk. So I, I think that's an important point. Last comments, last questions uh, before we quit. Did I miss anything in the chat room? Um, thank you for the presentation. Okay, well, you're very welcome. I, I hope that's helpful. And keep coming back, as we say in the rooms, and we'll see you next week. And we'll talk about uh, particular substances. And I think cannabis, uh, will be an important one that will uh, reflect back on some of the questions that we had today, but will remi remind me to come back to them. So thanks everyone for your attention and we'll see you next time.